Hey, good morning. I'm Bill Duggan from a a Thank you all for coming out so bright and early. I'd like to introduce our panel today. Again, Bill Duggan from a a Julian Moore from K2, Bill Bruno from Ubiquity, Tony Pace, the current chair of a a Board of Directors, formerly CMO at Subway, and Ben Jankowski of MasterCard. And uh, Ben is also the chair of the WFA, World Federation of Advertisers Media Committee. So we're here for the next 40 minutes to talk about this issue of transparency. The way we're gonna do this, I'm gonna make some um, brief opening comments. Um, Julian will take us through the K2 findings, seven or eight minutes. Um, Bill will talk about the ubiquity solutions to those findings. And then we'll have a facilitated discussion about uh, what they mean. And if we have time at the end, we can do about five minutes or so of questions. So first, some broad background as to how we got here. Because it's really been a long road for a a Our transparency journey has been going on for at least five years. When agency trading desks surfaced back in 2011, many of our members, it sounds kind of naive now, but many of our members were not aware. We did research, we talked to the trading desk, we published a white paper and talked about things like arbitrage and rebates and markups and that was published in 2011. In 2012, one of our board members actually came to us and said, I've heard about issues of rebates going on here in the US. Um, what does ANA know about that? And we partnered with our law firm, Reed Smith, to do some research at that time, um, researching our members, and we found that there was indeed a level uh, of awareness of rebates happening here in the US. Both those studies are on the ANA website, by the way. And then in 2014, we partnered with Forrester Research um, and we looked at transparency. And just a, a couple of slides to bring that to life. We asked our members, do you have any concerns about the level of, of transparency between you as the client and your media agency? At that time, 46% said yes versus 36% that, that said no. And over the past year have concerns about transparency been increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. 42% said increased and only 13% said decreased. So as a result of this research at ANA, we started, um, I'm, I'm sorry, just drilling down a little bit more. Rebates were near the top of the list with, with served impressions, agency arbitrage and others. So these were some of the elements of transparency. So we started uh, a media transparency task force in 2004 coming out of that uh, research, and AdAge in 2004 identified media transparency as one of the biggest stories of the year. But the world really didn't pay attention until John Mandel took the stage at the ANA Media Leadership Conference in March 2015. And then all of a sudden, these transparency issues were, were everywhere. And there was a huge debate in the industry whether they were happening or not. Agencies, after John spoke, um, the, the, you know, definitely denied that this was happening. So we were in a, a, a bit of a conundrum. On the one hand, we heard it was happening. Agencies were saying that, that it was not. So in June 2015, we issued an RFP um, to identify a third party organization to conduct a thorough and objective an analysis of media transparency issues, so to find out the truth. And then in October 2015, we announced the hiring of actually two firms, K2 Intelligence, for the fact finding and the combination of ubiquity and firm decisions for some solutions. So with that as broad background, I want to turn things over to Julian. Um, why, don't, why don't you come Great. up here and present? Wonderful. Julian. Great. Thanks, Bill. Here's your clicker. <laughs> Great. Thanks. And uh, thanks for the invite, Bill, and the introduction. So uh, my name is Julian Moore. I'm Senior Managing Director at K2 Intelligence, and we were the entity selected to serve as the independent fact finders. Um, for the assignment that Bill just described. K2 is an investigative consultancy. Uh, we focus on um, consulting, independent fact finding, regulatory and cyber offerings. And we pride ourselves on the talent uh, that we have at our, at our firm. And we pride ourselves on being independent fact finders. A lot of us are former public uh, servants that served in the public sector, either in uh, government or regulatory um, field. We have a number of former auditors, accountants, former former and state federal law enforcement officials at K2. Myself, I'm previously an attorney at Davis Polk and Wardwell, and then I was an assistant United States attorney at the Department of Justice uh, here in New York, where I focused on white collar and securities crimes. 
um, the, my final four years in the office serving as lead prosecutor of the Bernie Madoff uh, investigation. Um, I joined K2 two and a half years ago. And so um, we were honored to be selected in, uh, in uh, October, excuse me, June to, to lead this in investigative effort. So uh, the motivation was twofold that we, were, that we were informed. And that was to raise awareness of um, the growing concern about transparency issues uh, in the market. Uh, secondly, there was a lack of common perspective about whether certain practices were taking place. And so from our perspective, we wanted to do an independent assessment into this field, speaking to marketers, advertisers, agencies, to determine whether there was any truth to these rumors that Bill mentioned uh, to you all before. So the study scope and the parameters. Um, again, we were trying to focus on identifying and illuminating um, these non-transparent business practices should they exist. Um, and so let me take a step back and, and discuss what we meant by transparency. To us, that meant the full disclosure of relevant information required for informed and intelligent decision making and uh, absence of hitting conditions and agendas. Uh, and what do we mean by non-transparent business practices? To us, that meant any business practice in which relevant information was not disclosed. Um, it's important to know that transparency is different from contract compliance. When we first entered uh, this study, many people told us that uh, you have to look at your contract. And if, if in the contract between the media agency and the advertiser, if it provides that the agency does not have to be transparent, that's all that matters and that's all that controls. To, to us, that's different as to whether an agency is in fact being transparent though. And, and so what we wanted to do, despite whatever language might have been in the contract between the advertiser and the agency, is to actually just delve into studying what in fact are these non-transparent business practices that uh, we have been told were extant in this industry. So when we went about this, the ANA gave us strict directives, and that was that there was, this was not to be a naming and shaming exercise. Um, confidentiality and anonymization was therefore very important, uh, both to the ANA, to us, and more importantly, to the individuals we spoke to. So uh, with that regard, K2 was the only person in the room when we spoke to the sources we spoke to throughout this report. Uh, we had the fortunate opportunity to work with Ubiquity, but they served as our subject ma matter experts. They were not the fact finders in this mission. And the reason we, we were so cognizant of being uh, focusing on confidentiality and anonymization is because while this is a $200 billion a year in US media spend uh, in this business, we also realized that it's a very close community. And there's a lot of long-standing relationships, both between the advertisers and the agencies. And those relationships um, did not want to be broken. But at the same time, what we found is that many people, both in the agency field and, it, and in the marketers, they did want to talk to us um, to give us the information and, quite honestly, the documentary proof we needed uh, to conclude what we did in our findings. So, so uh, to step back, we started in um, October 2015. This was a seven-month-long study. Throughout that study, we spoke to approximately 150 people. Um, and this was important. We wanted to make sure we had a broad array and a diverse uh, um, sector of the population we were speaking to to ensure that no one was left out. So again, we spoke to media publishers, we spoke to advertisers, and, and uh, we, we spoke to people in different sectors of those fields. So we're talking out of home, print, media, digital. Um, for us, it was, a, it was um, imperative that we make sure that we had a diverse array of uh, individuals we spoke to to ensure that we were getting a full view of the landscape in this field. So of those 151 people we spoke to, um, 29, were from, 29 were advertisers, 56 were media suppliers or ad tech vendors, 39 were agency professionals, 10 were from trade associations, and 17 were from other fields such as consultant, legal, barter, or in post-production. Um, in fact, we sought out approximately 300 interviews throughout the course of the study. We were fortunate enough to have 151 people speak to us. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So uh, let's go to the findings themselves. Uh, first and foremost, um, and I actually believe this was the most important finding we found in the study, 
And that was the disconnect that we observed between the advertisers and marketers and their agencies. What was clear to us um, from the beginning is that the, from the ad advertiser's perspective, the agencies were acting and were there to act as their agents, as the name implies. And when I say that, I mean that the agencies were there to act in the utmost and best interest of their clients, that they had a fiduciary duty to always act in the best interest of their client. Interestingly enough, when we spoke to agency personnel, both current and former, they, infl they informed us that that was not necessarily the case, that their relationship was solely defined by the contract. And again, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes in the contract, agencies were explicitly allowed to act as principals. That means to not act as an agent, to not have the best fiduciary duty interest of their client, the marketer, um, in mind. So right off the bat, that was the most significant finding we found, that there was just actually a tension and a misunderstanding as to what the relationship was between these two entities. So um, to the heart of it, these non-transparent business practices, do they exist or not? Um, what was um, clear to us is that they do. Um, and what we found is that rebates do exist in this industry, um, and they come in several and various forms. The first form we highlighted in our report was that rebates were being served through cash and free media space. And secondly, um, they were being served through service agreements. So let me talk a moment about cash and free, me and free media space. Um, essentially what we observed, and again, this was through our uh, uh, conducting interviews with 150 people, but also requesting documentary evidence from them, whether that was in forms of contracts, internal memoranda, emails, uh, and the like. Essentially, agencies are seeking a percentage of the aggregate spend that the marketers are spending with their media publishers. They're getting a percentage of that aggregate spend from those publishers um, in the form of rebates, but they're not returning those funds um, to their client, uh, the advertisers. As we noted in the report at the time, we said that one large media supplier had stated that it has provided cash rebates to the agency holding companies. Again, notably during our report, we were sure not to name any individuals specifically. However, um, as you've all probably noticed in recent media lately, Google has recently disclosed that they do in fact pay rebates to agencies. Um, let me talk about service agreements. Now, what we did notice is that again, these rebates were given in the form of cash and free media, but we also noticed that the way in which agencies were receiving these rebates morphed a bit and became um, a little more difficult to find. And what we noticed one matter, one way of these agencies receiving rebates was the form of service agreements. And what I mean by that is an agency would form a service agreement with uh, a media publisher, for instance, and um, uh, presumably that service agreement was uh, an arrangement between the media publisher and the, and the agency in which the agency was to provide services to the media supplier. However, what we noticed is those services were nil, um, it, meaning that uh, they were services that the entity did not need, they were services that were given to every, that they were not specialized for that individual client, or in fact that they never in fact even existed. However, payment for those service ag ag agreements was always dependent on the amount of spend um, the agencies were bringing to those uh, media suppliers. So again, agencies were receiving payment from media publishers through the form of these, in the form of these service agreements, but no services were in fact being provided. Or if the services were being provided, they certainly, they certainly weren't being uh, worth the amount of money being paid for hey, them. Hey, Julian, just a time check. I got to ask you to maybe take two more minutes to wrap two, up your findings. I have three more minutes, so I'm gonna go to the next <laughs> slide. <Yeah. laughs> so. Uh, the next thing we noticed was that um, essentially that agencies were taking equity stakes in the agencies themselves so, and, and in the media publishers themselves. And um, by doing that, we noticed that agencies were directing client media spend to the entities that they actually had an equity stake in. So for instance, if an agency had a 5 or 10 percent interest in media publisher A, B, or C, they were more inclined to direct their client spend to that entity. Um, so I, I don't want to take too much more time, but 
one thing that I have to make clear is that these practices we found to be pervasive um, throughout, uh, throughout this practice. I mean, we, we spoke again to 150 people, but what we noticed is that these practices, these non-transparent business practices that I'm talking about, were present in all forms um, of the agencies, both independent and the major agency holding companies. They were, for, they were present in out of home, digital, um, uh, online, as well as print. Um, what, we, what we observed is that um, all of the agency holding companies were involved in this process. Um, and what we further observed is that uh, there was a systemic element to that. And what I mean by that is that uh, senior, in, uh, senior personnel at these agency holding companies were in fact on the signatory line of these non-transparent business uh, practices and the contracts that allowed them to flow. And I think at that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Awesome, great. So um, who here has read the report? I would strongly encourage, the report is about 55 pages, fairly easy reading, and uh, once you read the report, by the time you get to page 10, you could say that there's no doubt that these activities are, are happening. I now want to turn things over to Bill Bruno to talk about the solutions. Bill is with Ubiquity. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. So we know this is happening, right? Fact-finding mission discovered all of these non-transparent practices and Ubiquity and firm decisions uh, were brought in to write those recommendations uh, and the, the way forward in conjunction with the ANA. Ubiquity, um, where I'm the CEO of North America, is a uh, leading media and marketing analytics consulting firm, and Firm Decisions is a global uh, financial compliance auditor, so they're the firm that follows the money. Um, and what you'll, you'll see here as, as you read through our recommendations is that it's very easy to get negative. We tried to put a positive light on this and instead look at this from the perspective of, listen, this is happening. We found this is happening. Um, but how do advertisers capitalize on this opportunity to redefine the future of the industry? Right? And, and so you'll, as you read these, the recommendations, you'll see them coming from that light. You'll see that they point out several things that advertisers need to do as well as their agency partners. And you'll notice that it really focuses on sort of three high-level categories. One being the, the management of your agency partners. The second being the, the advertisers themselves establishing primacy and putting the right controls in place to, to sort of take back that primacy and, and create a higher level of transparency and accountability. And then third and final, you'll see a, a, a reference to a code of conduct um, because a contract can only govern the relationship from a foundational structural level but the day-to-day -day relationship that, that you have with your, your agency of record and with your media partners needs to have that code of ethics or that guidance of, of how that's going to be approached. And so what I'll do is, is walk through sort of the seven sections of the report or the seven strategic platforms here very quickly so we can turn things over for questions. Obviously, as Julian mentioned, you know, the, the, the most important finding was that fundamental disconnect. Uh, between whether or not an agency is acting as an agent or, or in a principal relationship, whereas they're out there ag basically aggregating media and selling it to, to advertisers, regardless of whether or not that's the right fit for their strategy and planning. And this is where you see things like the opt-in agreements, uh, particularly in programmatic. Um, and I've seen with many clients where, where these examples are, are opting advertisers out of their ability to actually have true visibility and transparency through how their media budgets are allocated. And this section and that fundamental disconnect ultimately is what's inhibiting advertisers from being able to, to truly understand how effective every marketing dollar is in generating an ROI for their business. The second, as you can imagine, and, and actually the next three sections focus on the contract themselves. Um, as Julie mentioned, it, it's not just about the contract, but if you don't have one in place or if it's been sitting in a drawer collecting dust for 10 plus years, as some of the examples that K2 found were, um, then it's definitely not taking into account the increased complexity in, in this environment that we live in today, particularly given the rise of digital over the last five plus years or so. And the contract needs to have Needs, well, one, it needs to be signed, but two, it needs to, to be up to date, it needs to be consistently reviewed. And what fell from that, um, sorry, uh, what fell from that was a great initiative uh, between the ANA and Reed Smith, whereas in parallel to the Ubiquity and Firm Decisions recommendations came a, a contract template that can be used to guide those discussions for advertisers uh, built off of what was done by ISBA in the UK. 
Uh, and the goal, obviously, is not to swap out your contract with that one, but rather use that as a guiding light to review your own terms and principles and figure out and prioritize you know, where the opportunity lies for, for you in, in your current relationships with media partners. Within the contracts themselves, there's a very specific clause around audit rights, and this is the most important clause in your contracts. Uh, this is what determines whether or not you can follow the money. I have clients that have some of the best audit rights in the world. I have some that don't. I have many right now that are fighting for new ones. Um, and the key point here is that if you want to create a new environment and redefine the future of this industry, you're going to have to start here. Because if you can't follow the money, then you're not going to know how your media budgets are allocated and you're not going to understand what's making you money and what isn't. And also how much money those partners are making as well. And then finally on the contract section is the governance. Even if you have the best possible contract in place, Given the complexity of this industry, given where it's going, given the rise of programmatic, given the extension of programmatic to TV, um, there's still several things that you as an advertiser need to stay out in front of. Uh, the analogy we used in many board meetings as we were writing these recommendations was the concept of a water balloon. If you squeeze the water balloon in one spot, the water goes to the other side. You know, there will always be opportunities or areas where transparency can be inhibited. Um, and without having the right governance in place, without having roles like a chief media officer or somebody owning these from an independent perspective, um, advertisers end up being at potential risk here. The fifth section, and actually the longest section in the recommendations, is focused around data and technology. I was asked why the other day, um, and I think Facebook gave us a really nice example of that. <laughs> um, you know, without, uh, without having ownership of data as advertisers across these five, these five areas, without being able to interrogate those data sets and validate the accuracy of those, and without being able to independently own and measure you know, your own results, you can't possibly sit there confidently and say that the data you're receiving or the advice or the analysis that you're receiving is unbiased and accurate. And so this level of, of data ownership is going to become increasingly more important. And quite frankly, what you saw from Facebook is most likely just the tip of the iceberg. And then uh, the last two sections focus on advertisers in the code of conduct. Uh, from an advertiser perspective, there's a lot that has to be done. It's not easy. It is going to require an investment. Um, I've had several advertisers ask me, you know, you know, well, where are we going to get this money? Probably by reviewing your audit rights and following the money. There's probably something there for you. Um, and then ultimately, the seventh pillar is around the code of conduct. And I think the most important piece to this is that we recommend that this is signed and attached to your MSAs between you and your agency partners. This needs to be part of how business is done between the advertisers and their, and their media partners. Um, it needs to be a, a code of conduct that outlines the day-to-day -day relationship and ultimately brings to the forefront transparency and accountability. Um, and like I said, it's, we think this is a turning point and an opportunity for advertisers. We think it's a way to redefine the industry and drive it forward and create that higher level of accountability. And so with that, I will turn things over to Bill to lead the rest of the discussion. Great. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Julian. So let's bring Tony and Ben into this. Tony, we'll, we'll start with you. What was... So what's, what's your broad view of the report, and what were the surprises to you, if any? Well, the broad view of the report is I'm glad that we did it, because as you mentioned in your uh, earlier comments, this discussion had been going on for about five years, and we could never get to agreement as to what the facts were. So was this behavior a couple of one-offs, or was it, as the report ultimately found, uh, pervasive? And I also think, to, to repeat what has been said about the fundamental disconnect, I think that really lies at the center of the whole issue here, right? So lots of things have changed in the media space. Uh, I was fortunate early in my career to uh, work at, with some great media people at Young and Rubicam, and also later on at McCann Erickson. A lot of the behaviors that were outlined here were, would have been considered so far out of bounds that they, people would have been shocked if that happened years ago. But, but what's happened? The world has become a lot more global. Uh, a lot of the practices in media outside the, the U.S., you know, if you think France or Brazil or Australia particularly, you know, those media folks would come into the U.S. and say, you guys are a bunch of pikers in media. Why aren't you doing this stuff that we're doing? And, and that, I'm sure that conversation was happening with great regularity. Now, you also had the added complexity of everything in the digital space, and what is everybody trying to do? They're trying to make their audiences look as large as possible 
so that they can talk about a low CPM so they can sell something. Uh, unfortunately, when you think about the sums of money involved in terms of digital media and everything else, you know, even people that are generally good people can be tempted to make sure that they make their numbers look good. And I think that that, that became a, uh, a big issue for everybody. So, you know, like Bill, I'm actually optimistic because this is put back onto the table. Okay, how are we going to do business together, right? It's, it's not our point of view at the ANA that agencies shouldn't be making money for providing professional services. The question is that needs to be understood and discussed. And if a lot of practices have come into play pushing on that water balloon that don't make a whole lot of sense from, from a marketer standpoint, that also needs to be discussed. Now people can say, oh, it's just advertising. Well, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're a marketing professional, which I know that my colleagues and I believe that we are, you're evaluated based on your return on marketing investment. And if funds are going to something that is not driving action in the marketplace, your ROI is going to be less. And if you're in a private or a public company, at the end of the day, you're responsible for the good investment of those funds to drive the brand and to drive business. And uh, essentially, some of this behavior is a de facto tax on marketing investment, which is going to suppress results. You know, if, if you if you talk around here about, you know, where is the economy, you know, people are, are well, well, maybe we're doing a 1.8 in, in 1 or 2 percent growth economy. Well, if you're a marketer, you've got you've to strive to achieve more than that. And if your money's not being invest, invested as wisely as it could be in terms of driving consumer or other audience behavior, that's a real detriment to you and the economy at large. So we've, we've had lots of discussions about what to do about this. Some folks have said, um, that this was the outcome that the ANA wanted. Actually, it wasn't. It would have been much better for us if the, uh, the K2 intelligence report had noted that maybe there were a couple of instances of this, but this wasn't, this wasn't pervasive and there wasn't a fundamental disconnect. The fact of the matter is they found something differently with their independent work, and we have to take action on it. And that action requires um, the collaboration of lots of different folks in the media space. Great. So let's talk about that fundamental disconnect a little bit more, and it, it'll lead into a question that I have for Ben. So again, we feel that this is one of the most important findings. I'm going to read from the report that many advertisers express the belief that their agencies are their agents, and as such are duty-bound to act in their best interest. Many advertisers also express the belief that this obligation extends beyond the explicit terms in their agency contracts. And meanwhile, while some agencies agreed with that, there were many others that said, no, the relationship is all about the contract. So Ben, I'm not going to ask you what you do at, at, at MasterCard, but I, I would love, you know, from your view of um, chairing the, the WFA and your experience in the industry, what might be some advice that you give to clients regarding contracts? No, I think it's a lot of, and we, you know, from, you know, on behalf of my brothers and sisters who sat on the Transparency Council, I mean, a lot of what, you know, Julian, you know, found and what Bill talks about are the things that, that we should be doing. And we're, and we're all, you know, we all have opportunities to grow. I mean, things about, you know, you, you mentioned, Bill mentioned, if you, haven't, if you haven't looked at your contract, you know, you know, if you haven't looked at your contract in 10 years, I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. The marketplace has just changed too much to have a static, to have the same contract that you had three years ago, five years ago. So the first thing is, you know, have a really deep dive and understand your contract. If you don't understand whether your agency, whether your, whether your media agency is an agency or a principal, that's a big problem. Um, you know, you, you, you gotta figure that out. Um, and a lot of the suggestions, again, I'm gonna sound like, I don't wanna sound like a broken record for, for what Bill talked about in a lot of the suggestions, but I think that, you know, I think that we, you know, the, the group that the Transparency Task Force, we, you know, we helped you guys put those together, and you know, they're all, they're all smart, simple things. None of them are. I mean, it's, it's just too important to, 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 to have status quo. So I'll give you a moderator's perspective about the contract: is that agencies have teams of people that that's all they do, contracts, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and they do it for not dozens or hundreds, but perhaps thousands of clients. So they have visibility into all of these contracts. Meanwhile, the, the average um, client sees their contract. So if, if knowledge is power, 
the power is with the agencies. And if you're the underdog going into the fight, you need to know that. So let's drill down on one of the very controversial issues regarding the contract, and that's the right to audit. Mm -hmm. So Ben first, let me go to you again. Yeah, I think what what right should, should advertisers have? Sorry. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what K2 found, K2 kind of did you know, to some degree um, is, is the best they could. They kind of uncovered where the, you know, where the activity had. In a lot of cases, it didn't happen at, you know, at the agency level. It happened at things like the holding company level or it happened for subsidiaries and things like that. Having the ability to be able to audit the entire, you know, the entire holding company, the entire, you know, all the subsidiaries. That's a, that, you know, if, if that's where, that's the K2 report <coughs> suggested that in many cases, um, some of the, you know, we'll call it rebates for the lack of anything better, you know, compensation did not necessarily reside within the, within the individual agency, but it resided within the holding company, within the family, in some cases even outside the country. They, you know, um, and we have to have the ability to be able to, uh, to audit that entire situation. And in a lot of cases, and Bill mentioned it, some clients have amazing, some marketers have great audit rights, and some don't. So, you, I mean, that's a, that's a really big thing to, under, to, to un, you know, just understand what your rights are, because in a lot of cases, a lot of what we're talking about, a lot of what K2 discovered is not going to be sitting there, you know, in the in you know in the you know in plain view in you know, in the agency that you're working with. Tony, anything you want to add? Well, let me try to put this kind of in layman's terms. Most contracts now, the agencies are compensated based on the manpower that they put forth uh, on the business, and usually the language states that the media is to be provided at cost, right? At the end of the day, if you don't have the audit right to find out that you're being given that media cost, I'm not sure how you really do business, especially if a, a media asset is passed through multiple uh, operating units within a holding company structure. And, and that, that, that's where the disconnect comes, frankly, because uh, if a client thinks that a market, thinks that they're getting a recommendation that is objective, whereas there's inventory that's there that they need to quote unquote move, and they're also going to benefit from that. That's that's not a circumstance that is good for the marketplace in any uh, any shape or form. And there's just too many pieces of the puzzle. I mean, you know, in the traditional, the old school, back when dinosaurs were on the earth, and I was, you know, a me assistant media planner, <laughs> you had marketers, you had agencies, you had TV stations, and you know, or radio stations or whatever, and and then it got to the consumer. Today, if you look at one of the, you know, those Lumiscape charts, which keep me awake at night, there's just too many places and too many parts of the. Too many pieces of the puzzle to, to you know, to it, it's just too complicated to not pay a lot of attention to where your money's flowing. And on the topic of audit rights, and this has been out in the trade press, this is where things broke down last year between A and A and the four A's. We had a joint task force, and the goal of that task force was to publish joint principles related to transparency, and we just couldn't agree. From K2's findings, you know, they saw that rebates could be happening through a deal here in the U.S. Um, but, the, but the rebate is paid um, at the holding company level in Ireland or Spain. So unless you have those audit rights that go throughout the organization to anybody that could touch your money, the audit rights essentially aren't of much value. Um, so now let's turn to stewardship of media. So, so Ben, you are unique in this industry, I believe, because you are, for all intents and purposes, the chief media officer at, at MasterCard. And um, we see very few people um, that are chief media officers. There are, um, you know, uh, there, there's a, a fair number of people that are media directors, but we, internally at the client, but there's also lots of companies that don't have that specialist mm -hmm. that focuses on media, and that was one of the recommendations in the report. So I, I would love for you and then Tony to talk about the value of that role. First, I love the title change. Thank you for the promotion. <laughs> um, but I, I think the point about the need to have senior, you know, senior level people being able to manage it. It used to be, and, and, and Tony can talk about it a little bit more, he had, he had a good analogy in, when we were talking about it earlier. There is a lack of real, you know, senior media people. The old, you know, the, the mindset used to be, and there's a lot of pressure on cost and marketers and staff and things like that. Um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a perception that back in the day you hired an agency to, you know, sort of, you know, to, to do all this work for you. So now to sit there, you know, and a lot of companies have, if they have media people, a lot of them are 
pretty junior, they're more administrative. In today's environment, if you don't have somebody who can who can dig through, you know, dig through this puzzle and unpeel this onion, it's a really missed opportunity. And it's, and it's you know, it's, it's, there's just too much money at stake to not have a lot of senior media people, um, you know, at co corporations. But I mean, you know, and Bill, we talked about it the other day. We should actually probably do a study to kind of unturn where, you know, it'd probably be an interesting study because there just aren't enough really senior media people who kind of know, um, you know, know both sides of it. I mean, a lot of the senior media people today, you know, I mean, Tony spent, you know, started an agency. I spent 27 years in the media department of an agency. And a lot of, you know, my contemporary, you know, the senior people spent a lot of time at agencies. Right, right. So we can kind of, you know, so we know a little bit more about both sides of it. But it's, it's just critical to have senior level people. And that sounds a little bit self-serving so I can stay employed, which is obviously a good thing. <laughs> uh, but it's really, it's, it's really important. So stewardship, in my mind, is a shared responsibility. And I think if uh, marketers were trying to offload the responsibility for media to their agencies, there may have been a point in time that that was OK. But they need to take much more of an activist stance with that. And you need somebody like a, a, a chief media officer. When you look at the, you know, what has grown up as the Loomiscape in digital, who the heck ever would have wanted that if they were designing something? Nobody would, right? You know, I see, I see Jason here, you know, the, the premium publishers are coming out and saying, hey, we want to do our own thing. We want to have our own exchange with TrustX. Boy, am I glad that's happening because that's going to help simplify things. We need lots of initiatives like that because if, if you had been planning for a good digital media supply chain, we wouldn't have what we have right now, would not exist. And I don't care how experienced or how smart you are, there are nooks and crannies across that place where you'd say, wait a second, this much money is going for that cookie or for that piece of information, and it's going to cost this many dollars and that much load time? If I was sitting at a table on an a la carte basis, I would have said, no, I don't want that. Because that's a nice to have, it's not a must have. And there are so many steps in the space that are that way, you, you kind of wish that you could uh, start over again in many ways and have something that was clearer and more straightforward to manage. I think inherently, and there's a quote from a CMO, and I forget, frankly, forget which one. The quote was, "When there's mystery, there's margin." Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's you know it's incumbent upon, it's in you know some people's interest to have a complicated environment, so you know so they can you know so there's a margin opportunity. Right, right. but it doesn't but, make it right. But you, but you think think about the, the the core constituencies there. You have the people that create the content. You have consumers or whatever audience consumes the content. And you got the marketers that pay for the content. Mm -hmm. How many of those folks were actually at the table with that design? They weren't. Yeah, yeah. Their interests weren't represented. You're right. It's got it's got to be simplified. Yeah. Great. So, um, two final questions for you, Tony, as uh, uh, chair of the ANA. So, we represent over 700 mm -hmm. members. Lots of big guys like Ben's company, Procter and Gamble, Unilever, but also many, many small and mid-size. Um, companies. Any particular advice to the small and mid-size on this? Well, we've been saying this all along. I mean, I know the report's about 60 pages, but you should read the K2 intelligence report. Depending on how quickly you read, it's an hour, hour plus investment of time, but it's time well spent. And you, sh you should read um, the ubiquity firm decisions report because, you know, we, we took the little poll at the beginning here. In the conversations I've had with an awful lot of folks, they'll come up to me and say, I don't really know a whole lot about this, what should I do? And my first question to them is, have you read the report? And the answer is often no. And then the folks that go read the report say, okay, now I understand, what's the next thing I should do? And I said, well, you ought to talk to your agency and, and make sure you understand the business basis on what you're working together, right? I mean, that sounds as, as simple as it is, but that's, that's really what has got to, got to happen. And um, media is so complex you need media professionals to help you navigate through that, but you also need to understand when they're making recommendations that are really thoughtful versus when they're potentially representing something that they have another interest in. And it's, it's, it's frankly as simple as that. And, and then final question, a couple people have already asked me today. So where are things between a and and our sister trade association, the four A's on this issue? Well, <laughs> You know, there's a, as people try to cover this whole circumstance, they try to create a whole lot of drama about it. You know, I'm not uh, inclined to be interested in drama. I like conversation, right? So there have been, going back, you know, several years, there have been extensive conversations about this. I would say that our 
uh, our perspectives are not aligned right now, but we don't have any ill intents to be very clear about that. Uh, I am, as I said, optimistic that good, smart people trying to solve these issues can make that happen. It may end up happening more on a individual marketer to individual agency basis with us providing some guidance just so people know the right questions to ask versus kind of having a global solution because I think there are different perspectives within the, uh, the membership of the four A's, frankly. Great. The red light is blinking, so Ben, Tony, Bill, and Julian, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.
Welcome, everybody, uh, to the uh, second part of the Trust Forum. Uh, I'm Jay Sears. I'm the SVP of Marketplace Development for uh, the Rubicon Project, a uh, technology company at the center of data-driven advertising. And we're going to do a fireside chat today with Bob Leodes. He's the um, CEO of the ANA. And I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about Bob, and then we're going to have kind of a free-ranging uh, chat um, about some of the work uh, that uh, you just heard about from uh, uh, Bill and his uh, guests before. But uh, I think of Bob as the CEO of the CMOs. <laughs> uh, so over 440 member companies, uh, 10,000 brands that represent over 200 billion in advertising spend. So by any measure, that's a big number. Uh, and 20 years at the ANA, um, uh, and prior to that, uh, a brief stint in television, right. uh, and then on the uh, finance side, on the brand side, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And marketing. All right. And, marketing. And, um, and really schooled in finance, too, which is, I think, another interesting thing, both uh, undergraduate accounting as right. well as a, a MBA uh, from right here in, in the city at NYU. Um, now, uh, we're talking a lot today about trust and transparency, and um, I want to ask you, Bob, from, from 1 to 10, if 10 is the total loss of trust, mm -hmm. we've Armageddon, uh, and 10 is complete trust, where are we on that spectrum today when we look at the relationship between ad agency and advertiser, the client? Yeah. I think that uh, there, there's no one real core number you can align to because clients and agencies, uh, those are managed on an individual basis. And there are some that have fabulous, wide open relationships that are legacy based, that they've been around for decades and decades. And they're probably at, uh, at a 10 uh, or very, very close to that. Okay. Uh, and even if there are some issues, they have the, the navigation tools to figure out what to address, what changes to make and how to be able to proceed forward. There are others probably with newer relationships where the ability to have created that long foundation of trust uh, has not been rooted or grounded deep enough. And so that when confronted with facts that came out of the K2 report and the prescriptions that came out of the ubiquity report, they may be a little bit more wobbly in, in their, their overall trust factor because they don't know where truth lies and, and where those facts are appropriately grounded. So I, I, I hate to default to the it depends, uh, but it does in fact uh, fall into a little bit of a diversified category. What I do think that we need to do is, is to come to grips with this on an industry basis. Okay. What are the appropriate principles and practices that we should be operating under? Um, I think that in the previous panel, we, we came to a realization that, that there was essentially a tectonic shift that occurred over the, over the past, call it five years where agencies and clients kind of moved in somewhat different directions. And you heard that with the conversation about um, clients thought that their agencies were operating completely as agencies, that were operating completely in their best interests, and that their fiduciary interests were appropriately taken care of. Whereas the agencies, because they have now drifted into increasingly amounts of principle-related activity, where they're buying and selling media into their own accounts, that they are more beholden to the essence of what their contract specifically might or might not say to guide that type of behavior. Candidly, clients, a lot of clients did not understand that. Because when you think of the, the breadth of that relationship that's existed for eons, right. most clients were thinking that it was the former way, the old way that we used to do business and that everything was a function of, I will rely upon my agency to be able to do that. Okay, so um, l let me ask the, the, the question another way, because sure. I do want to dig into uh, K2 and ubiquity, um, but because of the groundwork you've laid now, because of uh, this work that you've done, can we, uh, can we call the bottom in terms of the relationship between client and agencies. In other words, is the work uh, 
that's been done here foundational enough that for those folks at the lower end of the trust spectrum that now folks have the visibility, mm -hmm. the transparency, but the tools and maybe some of the knowledge now to, to build back up? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I think where it starts is that what the K2 and Ubiquity reports have done is it's, they've leveled the playing field. So go back a year or two okay. when there were, on one side, lots of these stories that were ruminating about you know, different issues that, in fact, were taking place. And on the other side, you had agencies that were saying, you know, no, right. we, we don't know what, what you're talking about. What that has done, what the two reports have done is basically provided a level playing field that says, these are the facts. And it's kind of like the old Dragnet show. These are the facts, and this is where we now start from, yeah. where that is ground, ground zero. That's truth for us. Yeah. So while every individual situation might be different, at least on the broad-based terms, we now have an understanding of the way these transactions were being conducted and that marketers should now be fully aware of what the potential of that relationship can and should be and can have a very informed conversation about how to be able to guide their relationships in the future. Yeah. Um, I, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about the history and how we got to uh, today. Because uh, you were telling me the genesis of this was you know, four or five years ago when Bill Dugan got a call from a, a board member. Right. And uh, tell us kind of how we got uh, to, to Mandel. I think a lot of people kind of latched Locked on yeah. in the spring of 2015. How we got there and why, what were the catalysts that it seemed to really accelerate right. after Mandel? So what's a little bit of the backstory, and why do you think the ga everything, the gas got hit uh, maybe <laughs> a year and a half ago? Yeah, back. and yeah. Uh, essentially, um, you know, problems uh, happen or yeah. in, in a very slow fashion. And when Bill got that phone call from one of our board members that poked at hey, we're hearing that there were rebates in the U.S. Right. And Bill's response, are you kidding me? Well, there's no such thing. Maybe yeah. it's Brazil or maybe it's in Europe or wherever, but it's not here in the U.S. We've never had that experience. Yeah. So little by little, we, we, as Bill mentioned at the very beginning of his previous talk, that there was this journey that we continued to dig deeper and deeper. And the more that we dug, the more that we realized that marketers were essentially unaware of this call bracket creep type of behavior that not many people were paying attention to, even though it hit ad ages, you know, word of the year and, and, mm -hmm. and air, story of the year. So when Mandel finally got to talk about it, um, it exploded because it finally said, here is where the issues are, and here are some redacted documents that prove my assertions. And that, everybody went, I think, berserk at that point in time because now it really moved to the forefront where this type of behavior came out of the shadows and moved to the, to the front of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the line, so to speak, which then gave us essentially the question, well, what do we do about this? That's right. And as we said, agencies saying one thing, clients are saying another. We had to bring truth to the equation, and that's when we decided that we needed to bring in some outside help to really define what that truth was. Yeah, and l I want to uh, back up for a minute too. In uh, there have been so many headlines about uh, the transparency work you've done at ANA. Is where does it fit uh, in the broader spectrum of priorities at ANA? Is it at the top of your list these days? Um, and is it? Uh, how all-consuming is it as an issue for you and, and your members? Yeah, um, well, one of the major areas of focus at the ANA is to, is to look at the industry to see where we have opportunities that have been unexplored right. or challenges that we need to overcome. Yeah. So that is part of our general mission is, is our work is to raise the tide of the entire industry, whether it benefits companies that are members or not. That's, we feel that okay. that's our responsibility. Yeah because everybody benefits whether they're members or they're not. Um, transparency at the time was, was all-consuming. 
uh, because of the amount of industry pressure to come up with where that truth and reality really were. Yeah. And I think Tony Pace made the point before is that, you know, this, isn't a, this wasn't necessarily a desired outcome, but was, what was the desired outcome was truth. Where we feel that this, this subject fits in particular is that it represents part of a broader discussion within the whole digital media supply chain, yep. where the broad-based word of transparency is at play. And I think Ben Jankowski before made the key point that, in fact, you got the Loomiscape that is your roadmap, where it used to yeah. be simply marketer, agency, media, consumer. We now go all around the mulberry bush to get an ad from marketer to end consumer. That's right. And considering that technology is at the core of this, you'd think it would be a lot simpler. So what we're seeing are behaviors that are emanating out of a very convoluted digital media supply chain that are truly affecting the industry and its productivity. So the fruits of that tree are issues relating to ad fraud, ad blocking, viewability and measurement, and then of course transparency. When you bundle that all together and say, Houston, we've got a problem here, and we really have to work to figure out how to simplify this chain, how to bring some common sensibilities to it so that everybody can truly understand why? Because we marketers, and with our agency partners, have to be able to make the, the best decisions possible to be able to build our brands and to improve our business performance. So what do we have when we look at the total digital media supply chain? Many studies have indicated that for every dollar that a marketer invests, only 40 cents comes That's out right. in reaching the consumer. That is a major loss that's going to a lot of parties but not working on behalf of the marketers. So that's the reason why all of those issues, all four of them, are consuming a lot of time at the ANA. Yeah, okay. And it was interesting when Ben brought up the Lumiscape um, too, because one of the things that um, I think digital, and especially data-driven advertising, allows for is to actually see the supply chain, right. to see the chain of custody. And you and I were talking about this just briefly before, in that the line of transparency, at least in the digital world, the programmatic world, used to stop at the ad network. Right. And there would be fleets of salespeople that would sell all this to the to operating agencies. And then it moved to the trading desk. And then it moved to the operating agencies. And now as your membership, I think, has become uh, uh, more cognizant of how this operates, you've done some of this work, some of the inherent architectural structure of kind of this new world order can be leveraged to see uh, and see who has their hand in the cookie jar and whether those entities are adding value um, or not adding value. Yeah, yeah and, and adding value, I think, comes with a responsibility to ensure that your marketer understands what's taking place. That's right. And really, that's at the heart of this. And no one, no one has a problem with the concept of a core rebate, but it needs to be disclosed. Disclosed, yeah. So that, in fact, you'll be able to make some decisions about the prosecution of where those resources go. If marketers decide that with their agencies that those resources should be shared, that's fine. That's up to the client and the agency to be able to direct where that goes. But when you're talking about a very, very complex chain of custody, I like the way you yeah. phrase that, now you're dealing with things where the marketers don't necessarily understand That's right. the, the flow of those funds, the cost of those right. funds, how those resources are being deployed, the decisions that are being made as a function of that, of those resources, and whether in fact the marketers feel very confident that those resources are working productively on their behalf to be able to build their brands and that they are being safely prosecuted along the way. That's right. We don't know that. We yeah. honestly do not know that. I think a lot of marketers, when interviewed, will say, I do not understand this. And we've done work that suggests that marketers feel essentially overwhelmed and undernourished in terms of their knowledge about this and recognize that they have to ramp up dramatically their knowledge of how digital works the digital media supply chain, how do we make the most effective decisions? Recall when we had legacy media, we had years and decades of experience and mm -hmm. lessons learned. When you have the explosion of programmatic and the, and the digital supply chain growing by leaps and bounds in every which way, how do you get that knowledge about what works and what doesn't work? 
It's very difficult, and, it, and the innovation goes at such a fast pace. So if you're doing it all day long, you're still running and running to keep up. And, and that's not to say that we don't like that. We love yeah. the precision and the efficiency that programmatic brings to the equation. But we also need to understand that it works in a consistent way that's right. for my benefit. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you about a, uh, a famous uh, comment that... Um, Erwin Gottlieb at Group M made, and I believe it was a 4A's conference a number of years ago down in New Orleans, right. um, where he talked about um, some of their trading being transparently non-transparent. Right. And on the digital side, and I know your work here covers the broad spectrum television, out-of-home digital, but on the digital side, they've built a very large business mm -hmm. um, in a division called Zaxis, which is a principal entity. Uh, Sorrel talks a lot, has talked a lot about it on earnings calls over the years and things like that. And my question is, is that, is that transparent? Like when you think about that, okay, he's saying, hey, I have a principal entity there. Right. So is that Talk to me yeah, about sure. that. I mean, yeah. you guys have thought a well, lot about this. In inherently, what, what starts to happen is that there is the, the foundation for a conflict of interest. Yeah. Uh, and embedded within that statement is essentially that marketers will not share in the knowledge of how their supply chain will work on their behalf. So what am I talking about in terms of a conflict of interest? Well, if, if an entity holding company, whoever, has responsibility for planning, buying, and executing, and you're not being fully transparent about that yeah. on behalf of the, of the marketer, then how does the marketer gain confidence that, in fact, that those are the optimal decision making that's, right. that's being done on behalf of the marketer, number one, and then number two, that it's working for everybody in a way that everybody truly understands. We used to have a system, when we were back on 15% commission, we got it. It was pretty straightforward. This is what you did, this is the money that you got, thank you very much, let's go home and, and let's execute. But when you're basically now postulating that this transaction process is now going to be non-transparent, well, it cannot work mm -hmm. where, a, a, an, a, where an entity is, whether their responsibility is for on behalf of the client, or on behalf of their shareholders. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you optimize that? How do you say that my client is my number one priority, at the same time saying my shareholder is, the, is my number one priority? The two cannot meet. It's almost like an accounting company. If you have an accounting firm, and you have a consultancy, as well as the auditing parts, those two are separated. Those two cannot meet in the middle. But in a holding company situation where all of them are kind of guided by the same entity where those decisions cross, the, the loss of confidence that takes place, I think, can be quite substantial. Well, so, uh, well, let's continue on this for a minute because uh, the holding companies are traded, publicly traded right. entities. So, um, how do you rationalize all this? The work for their shareholders and then the work for the client. Basically, you're saying eyes open, and create the governance and the contractual relationship? Are well, didn't it used to be that I provide value-added services better than the next guy? Yeah. That's what it's supposed to be about. Okay. I mean, in the end, I mean, that's what we as marketers have to do. We have to beat our competition. We have to yes. innovate. We have to create. We have to satisfy our consumers and our customers so that they will prefer my product versus your product. The same thing should exist in agency land where one company, one entity should be better off and produce more value for themselves based upon the value that they bring to the client and, and making sure that they are, first and foremost, winning. You cannot win when the chain only says 40 cents of my dollar goes yeah. and reaches the consumer. Yeah. That's a losing proposition. Yeah, yeah. What's, um, one of the conversations uh, we had um, uh, in Can this summer, right mm -hmm. after um, the K2 report came out, before right. Ubiquity came out, right. um, was with uh, Brian Weezer, the mm -hmm. um, 
uh, analyst at Pivotal. Right. And, um, and we were talking about the reaction of some of the holding companies, and he was describing uh, the reaction uh, of one as uh, Trumpian. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, how would you characterize or have you spoken to leadership of the holding companies in terms of their reaction to the K2 and the ubiquity work and how they're processing it? Well, obviously, they, don't, they are not embracing it. Uh, some of the media press releases that came out after the K2 report uh, demonstrated that, that they completely rejected the findings of the K2 report. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't much to discuss at that, that point in time uh, to suggest that we had a common ground. Yeah. Um, I think that with the passage of time, uh, more and more enterprises throughout the ecosystem are saying, yeah, this seems like an accurate representation of what, in fact, is taking place. So um, regardless of how you characterize it, the way that we move to a better environment is to not only agree upon what the base facts are, but also how do we reshape the relationships to ensure that there is a yeah. better understanding of how this thing works, number one, and how the value of those assets are appropriately managed, number two, to optimize marketers' business and brand performance. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the um, reaction of your members. Because sure. when I, I introduced you, I said, you're, you know, your members control uh, $200 billion worth of advertising spend. Um, we just got out of a series of media reviews that was $35 billion right. in ad spend. Um, and, you know, people were uh, kind of guessing how much of this had to do with some of the issues we're talking about um, today. And what, um, if, if you were to put your membership, uh, membership reaction into buckets, so ones who, uh, yeah, meh, <laughs> you know, uh, and then other ones who would say, okay, but not uh, so much I could do about it, and then other ones who are just on fire, mm -hmm. and um, and talking to agencies about, hey, we need to recast uh, and reinvent. Right. How do? What's the? I mean, anecdotal or, yeah. or yeah. what? What do you? What um, do you what do you think? I think what uh, this, the, the both studies in unison yeah. have demonstrated for marketers is that um, they, they just, uh, they can't ignore it. Yeah. Uh, they cannot just not pay attention to it yeah. and leave it to somebody else. Yep. Uh, if you read the ubiquity report in particular, yeah. uh, many of those recommendations are directed at the marketer. That's right, yeah. Let's start off with the basics. This is the marketer's money. Yeah. And Tony talked about the stewardship of those resources. They are ultimately accountable. If they outsource that accountability, then they are going to be as responsible as however is going to be ma the institution is going to be managing their yep. mo money effectively. So what we've found through anecdotal, I mean, we've not done any heavy-duty survey work on that regard, but what I think we have found are that there is a wide range of attention that is paid to the core of that responsibility and accountability behavior. It starts with the contract. As yeah. we've heard many stories, if the contract has been sitting in a desk drawer for five to ten years, well, we th then yeah. you're in a position where you haven't paid, a uh, paid attention to the contract, the evolution of the industry, how this, in fact, is now coming forward for more responsible management of those resources. So if for nothing else, I think that these, bo both of these reports have allowed the marketers to take a step back and say, do I really understand everything about how this works as I should? And I think we're finding that many marketers are seeing they really aren't. And so that there is a learning process that's underway I use my board of directors as an example. When we first, you know, when we uh, came out of the Mandel presentation, yeah. there was a little bit of disbelief that it might have been as intense as, as John Mandel uh, kind of provided it to be. But as they became increasingly familiar with the facts, 
that were, were evolving, there was, oh, okay, now we're getting it, we understand this, right. and that uh, a, a essentially ignited an ability for they to now look at their own organizations and acid test it. And I think that's, for, nothing, for all practical purposes, these reports are providing marketers with the opportunity to acid test their own system, to ensure that it is responsible, accountable, and focused on the best behavior that they can bring forward to optimize their performance. Let's remember that the marketers are ultimately responsible to their shareholders. There's, they right. are stewards for the shareholders' money. And if they are not optimizing the millions and billions of dollars of their investments, then they're performing in a substandard way. So this isn't just about the agencies, this is about the, the marketers as well. And collaboratively, we're hoping over the course of time that they can find that pathway to elevate both in unison so that they can report better results to both their respective yeah, sets of shareholders. Good. And you, you mentioned a, a, a minute ago, uh, and it was almost a harken back to simpler times when right. there was a 15% uh, commission, uh, and that's how it worked between uh, client and agency. And Ben Jankowski from MasterCard was uh, talking about before how uh, it's basically supposed to be uh, media at cost now plus uh, pay for headcount, you know, FTEs right. uh, often. And some operating agencies talk about, hey, we'd really like to be compensated for business outcomes. Uh, and then the debate ensues, how do you measure that? Right. But um, where does all that go? Do you think what we're talking about here uh, ends up having folks look at a, a, a reinvention of the financial relationship? Yeah. I yeah. do. I think that's, uh, uh, it, in fact, in my 21 years at the ANA, I think the, yeah. every year agency compensation is, has always been a, a topic of intense discussion and scrutiny. Right. Um, a, and just as we're saying that for marketers, they want fairness to be at the, at the basis of, of their relationship, so do agencies. And there are, there's no question that, um, not in all instances, but some instances, there, there has been unfair behavior. I mean, we've seen yeah. situations where you've got extended terms, particularly on media buying, that ex extend into the next century. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, perhaps even some margins that have been, we'll say, squeezed, uh, where it has become painful. Uh, I can't speak to any one particular situation yeah. because you don't know that full relationship, but there are certainly are levels of truth that we have to acknowledge. Uh, and if, in fact, uh, uh, compensation is not being uh, adequately prosecuted, then we as an industry have to find those better ways because mm -hmm. we cannot let agency comp uh, or the lack thereof be the excuse yeah. for non-transparent behavior, which yeah. we've heard. We've yeah. heard that uh, profoundly over the course of this time as well, you know, my margins are getting squeezed so I need to do something. Yeah. Well, you don't, the, the non-transparent, non-disclosed behavior is not the something that should be done we have to do is to make all of that fully transparent, both the pressures that the agencies are feeling, the pressures that the marketers are, are seeing, and to be able to come up with the fair pathways that allow for all of us to share in the, in the success, the joint success, in a far better way. Do I have those answers? No. Do I think that we should use that as a point of collaboration as we hopefully evolve from this situation? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, and on the client side, the resource or the type of uh, uh, employee they need to, uh, I'm going to use your word, like prosecute some of the right. observations and recommendations here, who is that person and are they typically in place on the client side or what are you, what are you telling now, your Yeah, in fact, I yeah. think that's the reason why in the ubiquity report, uh, we recommended the, for the creation of a chief media officer. Okay. Uh, we, and whether it's that or a, in a department or something, yeah. think about the size and scale of what we're talking about, particularly now when it runs across a gamut of media, much of which didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, is, the, is the level of accountability that exists today across the media spectrum across the investment spectrum, is it where it should be? If it's existing in different pockets inside the company, 
then it's probably not being optimally managed. And we have spent a lot of time talking about industry uh, focus, mm -hmm. a lot of time focusing in on organization. How do we optimize That's a marketer's right. organization yeah. in order to bring better uh, uh, understanding? You, you're in the data business. Yeah. How are we taking that data? How are we leveraging that data? How are we now optimizing all of those resources to come out with results that the marketers are, in fact, proud of? But if, if, in fact, it's a very decentralized approach to media management, then it's doubtful that everybody's playing by the same rules inside that company. Therefore, the need for some degree of centralization, we think, in order to bring greater optimization. Right, right. That makes sense. And, and one of the things uh, I often say when uh, talking to folks trying to understand the, the landscape of this new world we're all dealing with is understand the edges. So understand how the media owners and right. advertisers are really thinking. And I think some of, some of the recommendations and thought processes you're talking about mm -hmm. here start to really uh, change behavior, right? And they're, yeah. they're kind of winners and losers from that. Um, what about some of the um, market reactions? Uh, so um, forays has their own set of principles. Mm -hmm. um, I saw, uh, you know, you and I were talking, I think, sometime last week, and I thought, oh boy, you know, uh, we're, we're, now we've got a, I, I'm up to date on this. You know, Bob and I are in sync. And then um, uh, Media Smith and Empower, two big independent agencies right. and membership, members of 4As, dropped their membership mm -hmm. uh, because of a lot of what we're talking about um, today. There was the Facebook news, mm -hmm. uh, the Dentsu news out of Japan. Uh, uh, a couple other clients that have put their uh, agency relationships, I think, uh, uh, nationwide, uh, and J.P. Morgan was announced already, and um, into review. So what, what's your observation of those reactions, and which ones do you think, okay, and which ones do you think, come on? Well, uh, this is, you know, when you throw everything into the pot, Yeah. You're never really sure what's going to come out of it, and and uh, we're we're only a few months beyond the the release of the reports, yeah. and there's this digestion phase where we all have to understand the information. And as Tony Pace before it admonished everybody, and Bill Duggan did, read the reports. Yeah. What we have found is that people are just grabbing onto the headlines and not reading the reports. Yep. There is a gold mine in those reports. And if you're just going to listen to the headlines, you're probably not going to get the gist and the flavor of what you need to take away in, if you're going to change your behavior, whether you're a client or an agency or somebody else that's related to this transactional process. And we are seeing different outcomes of this. We are seeing some things going into review because maybe they need to refresh their dialogue. Maybe it's one of those companies that haven't uh, looked at their contract in five years and now need to go back to the well and saying, are we really up to speed? Are we really on the same, same playing field? What I said at the very beginning of our, of our conversation, Jay, is that despite everything we apply to the industry, this is still about one-to-one. -one. This is with client with their respective agency. And everybody's going to make the best decisions that are appropriate to them. What we're hoping at the forefront of this is a greater degree of focus you know, on being transparent so that I know what you're doing, you know what I'm doing, and that we can have an honest dialogue about how to make each other winners. You know, even though that the, the 4As has its own particular set of transparency principles, it's great. We don't agree with everything that's in there, but we agree with a lot of it. Okay. And so, good. If they're pushing transparency and they believe that that's a cornerstone of the client agency relationship, then we're pleased to see that. And perhaps over the course of time, we can get greater degree of convergence uh, and having them appreciate some of the work that we have done in order to be able to facilitate for the clients and the agencies to get on the same page again. Yeah, good. Um, what about, um, how, how do um, you think about measuring this on a go-forward basis, in terms of the impact of the work you're doing here, and any subsequent uh, change in 
behavior of your membership and their relationships with their agencies? How, how have you thought about yeah, that? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a slow roll. Yeah. Um, I, and I don't know because so many of these things are yeah. client to agency and, and more often than not behind the curtain. Yeah. It, it probably will be difficult at first to kind of understand what that forward impact is going to be. Yeah. Uh, we hope that probably in time we will do some type of survey work with our members to uh, to, in fact, uh, determine whether they have evolved or changed or have learned. Uh, but in the end, uh, we ke I keep bringing this back to performance. Um, you know, with the evolution of the supply chain, with the evolution of all the, the current behavior, mm. we have to start, we have to go back and say, what's been the end result of all of this? Yeah. And what we see is still a very low growth of revenues by many of our marketers and okay. members. All of this is for them to succeed. And if we're in the plus 1% to 3% range in terms of revenue growth, I'm not sure that this is all working on behalf of the marketer's best interest right now. We have to challenge ourselves to get to a higher level of performance. And we have to look at everything, whether it's the efficacy of the supply chain, the efficacy and effectiveness of our relationships, whether it's our own particular practices within the marketers and the way we're organized. We have to go back to square one on, on a lot of these things to be sure that we're taking advantage of everything that can work to our advantage and putting that into place. And that's why I say I think a number of these things are a bit of a slow roll so that we can get them institutionalized and move to a higher level of performance. Yeah. And I, I do want to say for folks that haven't read K2 or Ubiquity, uh, and Bill was talking about it before, and he said, oh, you only need to read the first 10 pages. This thing is like a Tom Clancy novel. I mean, you have really <laughs> got to dig in. Uh, it's it's uh, summer's over, but it's a, it's a it's a quick beach read. It really is fabulous. Um, but um, what's the? I mean, the all the opera, all the headlines. Uh, they everybody loves a doomsday headline. Yeah. But what's the op? What's the opportunity here? Like, why should you and I? Uh, you representing your membership, agencies uh, in the holding companies, uh, my company or my sector as it's the technology uh, facilitating a lot of data-driven right. advertising. Why should people be excited? Like what is, it seems to me there's a tremendous opportunity here for reinvention. Yeah. So how, what do you think about that? And we can end here on a high note. Like yeah. how do you, how, how do you think about that? And how do we have that part of the conversation? I, I totally subscribe to that. I mean, we think about every level of innovation that's taken place over the last five years. Uh, you know, the creation and institutional of social media, mobile marketing, uh, real-time marketing, so on and so forth. There yeah. is so many good things. Programmatic. Yeah. yeah. There are so many good things that we have at our fingertips. And the question is, were we optimizing them to the advantage of both clients and agencies? Underlying that was a bit of rot, a bit of decay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's kind of like when you look under the rock, you know, is it really clean? And the answer yeah. was, it wasn't as clean as we thought it was. What I think this really represents is an opportunity to scrub that surface down yeah. and to ensure that we're operating with far better disciplines than we ever have before. And so, what this situation has given us is the opportunities to find those pathways, to eliminate the things that have been holding back the relationships, to remove the uncertainties that existed so that we can all get in aligned and, and put a lot of these subjects to rest and then to build that new foundation. I think the previous panel talked about that, is that yes, this is maybe a codification of what went wrong or didn't go as right. Good. Let's get past that and move on, because yeah. there's a lot of opportunity in front of us. All of these areas of innovation that I just talked about are there for the utilization of the clients and the agencies to move to a more prolific, more profound, more uh, uh, energetic approach yeah. towards building better relationships, better uh, brand and, and business performance. So let's use them. And let's do it in a way where we all get it, we all understand, and that we're not dealing with a non-disclosed, non-transparent kind of way. Otherwise, we just might as well all be service vendors to each other. That's not the basis of a client-agency relationship. That has always been about an integrated partnership, hand in glove. Yep. We need to get back to that, and I think these reports provide us the opportunity to do so. Yeah. 
Well, I think there's a great foundation to build up from here and, uh, and really innovate in the spirit of uh, partnership like you've just I spoken agree. about. So Bob Leody is from ANA. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, too. Okay, Good thank job. you. Thanks. what you came for lightning strikes every time she moves and everybody's watching her but she's looking at you what you came for lightning strikes every time she moves Target's been neutralized. I'm heading to the hotel. Check into the penthouse. The name's Hunter. Certainly, Mr. Hunter. I have your reservation right here. Uh, wait, did you say Hunter? Mm-hmm. No, I don't have a Hunter. But you emailed the confirmation to my watch. Uh, well, marketing handles emails. Oh, I have a Hanson. No, it's Hunter. I picked my room on your app. Oh, we have so many apps, I know. But I'm a platinum member. I even have a promotion from your, um, from your website. Promotions are on a different system. 
but I do have a single on the ground floor, Mr. Hanson. It's Hunter. My name is Hunter. Everybody. It's nice to see everybody here. Uh, we are here for uh, a panel on improving the online ad experience for consumers. Consumers are increasingly frustrated with ads that disrupt their experience, interrupt content, and slow browsing, as indicated in part by the emergence of ad blocking. When consumers have a negative experience with ads on a site, it impacts publishers, advertising technology companies, agencies, and advertising. To respond to this increasing problem, leading international trade associations and companies involved in online media have formed the Coalition for Better Ads to improve consumers' experience with online advertising. We're fortunate this morning to have several members, uh, founding members of the Coalition's plans, uh, who are going to discuss the Coalition's plans. Uh, Alana Gombert, uh, who is the president, uh, I'm sorry, the general manager of the IAB Tech Lab uh, on the far end. Uh, Bill Tucker, the EVP of Media and Data Practices for the 4As. Lee Freund, president and CEO of the Network Advertising. Rob Roth, EVP and CIO of the ANA. And Scott Spencer, director of product management uh, for Google. I'm Stu Ingus. I'm at the uh, Venable Law Firm and am serving as the coordinator of uh, this coalition. And what we hope to do is to uh, tease out first among the group and then hopefully uh, get engagement from all of you uh, some of what we're after and what we're trying to achieve uh, in this effort. I see our friend uh, Jason Kint here also I'll recognize uh, in the audience who uh, is also a, his organization is also a, a founding member and Bob Leodes I see out there. Hello, Bob. Uh, uh, another leader uh, in this effort. So um, why don't we just dive in. Um, each of uh, your organizations represent different parts of the online advertising industry and come to the issue from very different perspectives. Could each of you speak about your organization's interest in the issue and your motivation to improve the ad experience uh, for customers? Why don't we start uh, with uh, Rob? Um, thanks, Stu. I you know, the work that the uh, coalition is doing is a, a natural extension of what marketers do every day. You know, trying to figure out how to reach and to engage with consumers is fundamental. So, you know, we look forward to working with all the members of the coalition to figure out the best way to engage with those consumers to deliver advertisements that have a good experience. Great, thank you. Uh, Alana? Sure. Good morning, guys. Uh, I'm the engineer in the room, one of them anyway, and I run the IAB Tech Lab, and our job is to support the coalition on the product side. So we will be helping build whatever tools needed to support the, the efforts. Bill. You know, I think the consumer frustration with the advertising experience is a problem for, for not for all of us, ag advertisers, agencies, publishers, but of course consumers. And They've expressed their frustration with the growth of ad blocking in a global way. Why now? Um, back in May of 2016, um, the, the four A's, the a and and the IAB hold a joint board meeting every year. The focus of that board meeting was uh, you know, the consumer experience with internet advertising, the problems and the, and the, uh, the growing issue of ad blocking. So coming out of that, of that, um, that joint board meeting, it, there was consensus that um, an industry-wide solution uh, was the best way to approach building better advertising experiences for consumers. And uh, I, it quickly, um, you know, the coalition with, 
with uh, more stakeholders and members has been put together, uh, which shows, I think, the breadth and the depth and the commitment that, um, that the industry is making. Um, the 4A's uh, board is completely supportive, and some of our you know, larger holding companies have already signed on as, um, you know, as founding members, you know, groups like Group M and Omnicom. Great, thank you. And uh, uh, Scott, a particular thank you uh, coming in as a company rep with the Trade Association reps. Uh, give us your perspective on, on the initiative. Uh, sure, thank you, Stu. Um, at Google, we, we really want to focus on uh, the user, on consumers, and trying to understand uh, from their perspective when they look at advertising, how can we uh, most respectfully work with consumers to ensure that the Advertisers that want to get their message out to consumers can do so in a positive way so that uh, content creators can be able to uh, monetize their content and be able to do so in a respectful way. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen that uh, for some consumers, the experience that they get can be one that's frustrating and causing them to take action where they would do something like installing an ad blocker. And so uh, we are really excited to be able to work with uh, this group and others to be able to understand what's driving that consumer decision so that we can, uh, working across the, the sell side and the buy side, come together and identify what are the challenges consumers are getting, what are those experiences that are really frustrating them, identify what those are, and uh, together as an industry be able to say these are things that we shouldn't be doing anymore so that consumers are not feeling like they're alienated from the, from the process of being able to get to content and uh, being able to get uh, an advertiser's message uh, to them. And so uh, that's something that requires coordination across. It needs to be um, uh, done in, together with lots of groups because uh, it's a hard thing to change an industry like this and uh, we're really excited to be working with this group to do that. Thank you all for, for that answer. Back to the uh, associations, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll lead off, uh, Alana, with you. Um, what role has ad blocking, Scott referenced uh, ad blocking as relates to consumer experience, what role has ad blocking played in shaping uh, the Tech Lab and IAB's members' views on consumer perspectives regarding online advertising? And, and also, if you could, um, a lot of this effort uh, derives in part, uh, Bill referenced the initial three trade associations. The IAB have been doing a lot of work uh, as its own organization and tech lab on this that this group will draw from. Maybe speak a little bit to that, please. Sure. So the first question, ad blocking, our, our members uh, across the board and the tech lab is global. So we work with the IAB US team as well as the global IABs. And the question of ad blocking I guess a year and a half ago now, it really came to the forefront. I joined six months ago. My predecessor, Scott Cunningham, worked very heavily on the Lean Initiative, light, encrypted, ad choice supported, non-invasive, very simple. Uh, but it really spoke to the need to address the user experience in digital. Um, we also introduced a program called Deal, which is a conversation between a publisher and the consumer. And all it is is, one, a detection script, so an ad blocker detection script to see if a blocker is installed. If it is, a publisher has the opportunity to send a message to that consumer and say, hey, I see an ad blocker is installed. Here are some options to have that conversation, lighter ad experience, subscription model, et cetera. And we found that the conversation is eye-opening to both the publisher and the consumer because it's a very easy way to start that dialogue about ad blocking. Um, so it's very important. It's very important to the tech lab and to the IEBs around the world. Um, but user experience is also equally as important. I don't want to muddy the two. Ad blocking obviously is an issue, but the, the paramount focus of my team is the consumer experience, user experience, and advertising effectiveness. And that will, as, as it is it improved, it will hopefully alleviate the ad blocking problem. Great. Well, thank you for that. Uh, Bill? Um, same question back to you. You know, what, what role has ad blocking played in shaping your members' uh, views on consumers' perspective? I mean, you know, agencies, creative agencies, media agencies study the consumer every day, as do advertisers and publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they study the, the relationship 
uh, that exists between consumers and brands, the relationship between consumers and the media, consumers with each other, and consumers in the world. And uh, so starting with the consumer is, is, is in our DNA. And you know, clearly, uh, consumers uh, in today's world vote every day for, for participation with brands and with ads. And, and consumers are voting. And uh, so, you know, that's kind of the foundation. I think what the coalition uh, is, is going to help us do is, is, and we'll probably talk about re research, you know, is aggregate some of that that is out there across the trade groups and, and, and companies globally and begin to get a foundation uh, uh, to, to enable the building of, of the practices and the implementation of standards. Great, thank you for that. Lee, tell, tell the group a little bit about the thrust of your membership, which in part was founded years ago uh, in response to a, another consumer uh, issue and consumer experience and how your members are looking at uh, this issue. Sure, good morning everybody. Uh, so the Network Advertising Initiative uh, started a long time ago, made up of traditional third-party ad networks. And we, were, we came together as a trade association and a self-regulatory organization to solve the problem of uh, consumer privacy. And so there was a, a, an, an earnest wish of those companies, the technology companies, to provide choices and transparency. This is the session is about transparency today, to provide transparency to consumers about what t how those ads that you're seeing on your screens have been selected for you. And so uh, this was a 15-year, 16-year long at this point um, uh, ordeal, <laughs> and, uh, in, in a, and, and we've been really successful at trying to get that point across to consumers, and we can talk more about that as we get further into the panel, but our, our members have evolved from st standard ad networks to cover most of the advertising technology space, so all of the folks that uh, connect those consumers to those publishers and help create great experiences online. So we are the pipes, if you will, uh, that make all of the, these connections work. And so we felt, and our members felt very strongly, that uh, as ad blocking and other consume, negative consumer experiences are affecting the entire industry, as the pipes of that industry, we wanted to be involved in the conversation about how to fix it. And so that's the reason we're here, and uh, you know we have a little bit, our trade association also is a self-regulatory organization, so I think, Stu, you'll get to that later, but we can certainly help uh, with our own experience with um, making companies accountable for the things that we decide to do to help consumers. Rob, your organization obviously uh, touches directly with the consumers. In some ways, it starts with the consumers, or in the business side, it, it starts uh, on this issue with the advertisers. How, how is your organization and the ANA uh, looking at ad blocking as relates to the consumer experience? <clears throat> well, clearly, ad blocking, anything that prevents us from being able to um, engage and interact with the consumer is something that we would take very seriously. I mean, not only does it, does it uh, affect the overall economics of the internet as it kind of exists today, it, it denies us the ability to have that conversation um, that supports that. I think that you know we still need to be able to go out to create meaningful relationships with our consumers, whether it's on the digital platform or on other platforms. So we obviously have a vested interest in, in making sure that our messages get delivered, support the publishers um, in order to, to support the content that people get today. Thank you for that. Scott, uh, one of the things that we've really, that, that the coalition has been uh, premised on is that ad blocking is really a symptom of the larger kind of consumer experience issue. And I, I know Google has been involved in thinking about this a lot. You referenced it earlier from uh, consumer research uh, and the consumer research perspective. Can you give us uh, your perspective and also speak really on behalf of the group of how we're looking at consumer research to uh, help inform uh, our initiative? Uh, sure, and there are two things to sort of think about in that frame. The first thing is in terms of how one has to approach this question. Uh, one of the reasons to bring, uh, uh, it makes sense to have the buy side, the sell side, all these groups together is because consumers 
when they see uh, a, a bad ad experience, when something is frustrating to them, they don't understand our industry of being able to say, hey, uh, that was an ad tech provider that was in the middle of a, of a creator that came from some agency that was then put there on this site. It's just an experience to them. And they are just as likely to be frustrated with the advertising side, with the, uh, with the, the brand behind that, as they are with the publisher site that the, they found this experience on. And so because this is not a problem where consumers are directed in, in one particular area in terms of their understanding or their ability to know what's going on, uh, it affects everyone in this ecosystem in terms of, of the negative impact that it can have. And uh, so we've been spending a, a large amount of time and effort to just understand consumers and, and what they see when they go to these sites, what these different experiences can mean. And uh, bringing uh, uh, ways to understand this in terms of what kinds of ads experience, ad experiences are frustrating the consumer or creating annoyance to the consumer? Is that even the right words to use to, for a consumer to understand how they're feeling about this to drive them to ad blocking? And uh, the research has been very interesting in terms of understanding uh, certain ad experiences that can be very similar but have dramatically different impacts on consumers just by how they're presented. There are ways to create uh, ad experiences that can be a full page kind of experience to a consumer that can be incredibly positive and there are ways to uh, have that same amount of space used that can actually be uh, very concerning to a consumer. Trying to understand and break that apart in a very granular way is challenging. Uh, if you look at things like um, uh, ad formats, if the ad format is in a way that the consumer feels it's blocking access to the content, that can be very frustrating to the consumer. If the same ad, the same uh, exact size is done in a way that they feel like it's just in passing, uh, even if it's exactly the same exposure, time, viewability, it doesn't matter to them and they're able to, to accept that and be much more receptive to both the publisher site and to the, uh, to the advertising message that comes there. And so it's trying to understand from that consumer perspective how we can differentiate that and how we can work together to understand these are things that are really frustrating consumers. These are the things that together we don't think make sense to do and we think we can move forward uh, as an industry without them. Thank you for that. Building off of that, maybe I'll shift it back to you, uh, Alana. Um, assuming we can get to a, a consensus among this diverse set yeah. of, of players and uh, on a global basis and, and we're confident we're going to reach, reach uh, such a consensus uh, on standards. What, what should the various sectors of the industry uh, be thinking about on how these standards will translate into action and, and meaningful things that they should be doing? That's a good question. Well, you're leading us, so we'll get there, Stu. Um, but I think the simplest answer to that is the solution has to be simple. Um, we need to figure out as a coalition which criteria work for markets across the world. Um, we also have to be sensitive to certain markets as well. So as we create solutions, as we create criteria, as we create solutions all across the board, we have to know that different markets operate in a different way. So that's number one. Um, are there underlying uh, user experience best practices across the board? Yes. Um, so being global, being buy and sell side agnostic, making sure that we are incorporating everyone's feedback in the right way is also very important. Um, and from our perspective at Tech Lab, we have both agencies, marketers, publishers, and platforms, and everyone uh, is, is equal uh, in our world, and that needs to be translated into the coalition as well, right? So we have to take all the feedback in, create the solutions, and make them simple and easy to understand, and in some cases, sensitive to the markets they're being rolled out in. And can you speak a little bit to the technology and the approach, it, or, or you know, the tech lab's been involved, it does its name, and some of the yeah. technology development. Any sense on, on, and I know we're early days here, but on the translation and the, into sure. the technology? Sure, so we are early days. Um, I'm not entirely sure what we're going to build uh, as a coalition uh, long term, but the IAB Tech Lab is building a lean scoring algorithm that was already underway before the coalition was formed. And what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the criteria used in that scoring algorithm uh, is vetted by the coalition. So that's step one. Um, 
And then step two, and in tandem, is sitting with the working groups. We have the tech working group, which, surprise, surprise, we're going to be help running that group. Um, and we'll be creating a roadmap based on the feedback from the coalition as to how we're going to move forward building tools and software. Great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Lee, you know, this industry collectively uh, moves uh, unbelievably quickly. Uh, and um, so once we get to a place where standards and, and tools have been developed by the coalition, how, what's your sense from your experience with the NAI and other organizations working across industry uh, on how the coalition can uh, stay current and, and relevant uh, on the consumer experience issue? Yeah, well, I think the first and most important piece to that puzzle of staying relevant and staying current is the fact that we are a cross-industry coalition. And so input from all of the players, publishers, uh, ad networks, advertising and technology companies, individual companies is really important. And, and I think uh, other coalitions that we have formed, such as the DAA, uh, also in response to kind of consumer transparency issues around privacy and targeted advertising, have really borne fruit in terms of continuing the dialogue among those coalition members to make sure that we are staying on top of current technology. And so the, both the DAA and the NAI have um, constantly looked at new innovations in technology and have issued <clears throat> guidance, best practices, and other um, documents that help uh, our members think about the ways that the codes of conduct or the standards that we might develop here can be applied to new and innovative technologies. So some examples of that in the past have been uh, uh, advice and guidance and adaption of code regulations related to mobile uh, and to uh, cross-device advertising. And we're looking at smart TV, we're looking at Internet of Things. There's, there's always a constant um, give and take with the with my trade association members, but also with coalition members at the DA le a level to make sure that our code stays relevant. I think whatever standards we develop are going to you know, need to be technology neutral, which is something that we learned um, in the consumer privacy space, that being technology neutral and letting companies individually innovate on what how, the, the particular application of those standards is really important. And so, um, so that's how I think we're going to, you know, having a continuing dialogue and staying on top of the technology is the way that we, and making sure that the codes and the standards are uh, broad enough to let individual companies innovate is, uh, is the path forward. Rob, this question will be directed to you, um, but all of the organizations represented here at the table have been independently exploring solutions. Uh, to address this issue, um, improving consumer experience, the externalities, but sometimes with ad blocking and other, other limiting factors. Um, it, the question's been raised uh, upon occasion by reporters and others. Uh, to me, well, you know, the ANA, as the marketers and brands themselves, could just, on their own, try and define a, a set of standards that uh, that its members would would try and. Um, uh, require, uh, you know, in, in an individual basis, but the members could try and set the standards that, that they wanted in order to do business uh, with others. So, you know, why is it that the ANA uh, has decided to come together uh, with all of these other parties to address the issue? Well, I think we recognize that, you know, our partners here in the coalition are experts in their respective areas, whether it be the network side, the audience science side, whichever. We, we get it from a consumer perspective. We realize that we need to be less intrusive and we need to offer a compelling experience. And who, by partnering with others in this coalition and, and you know, building upon the insights and the research that Google and others are doing in this space, I think it gives us probably the best all around potential solution to address these concerns. Scott, uh, come back to you for a second. Um, a lot of the organizations here, while they represent global companies, um, there are uh, similar partner organizations or affiliated organizations of theirs around the world through all the different geographies. Google, of course, is, uh, is in all places uh, for all people. And, um, one of the things that, that the group has uh, uh, put down as one of its founding uh, 
principles is that the solutions in the dialogue will be global in nature. Can you give us uh, kind of your perspective, Google's perspective, uh, on why this is important and, and how we're approaching this initially? Well, I, yeah, I think what's interesting is th this is a group to get together that doesn't happen often, right? This is a, a really broad set of organizations representing very different parts of our ecosystem that all agree ad blocking is a challenge, but ad blocking itself is uh, really a symptom of the ad experience challenge we're all facing. And that's transcending buy side and sell side, it's transcending uh, geography. In Europe, the ad blocking rates are considerably higher than in the US or in Asia. Uh, but it's a problem that uh, groups around the world recognize that we need to understand how, uh, how consumers are interacting with the advertising and why they're being uh, driven to, why they, they have this desire to be able to react with uh, something like ad blocking. And so I think it's really interesting um, that no one has come and said, gee, you guys, you know, just this, this is just the ad blocking problem. We don't need to look at the ad experience. Everyone has come together with the coalition, the broad support we've gotten both uh, in creating it, and I believe the, the number uh, of uh, companies interested once the announcement happened a couple of weeks ago was a tremendous amount of support from a very broad range of different companies. And so to me, uh, this implies that we're sort of hitting a, something that resonates with the industry, something where people are saying, yeah, that, that makes sense. We need to uh, work together. We need to understand what's annoying consumers, and we can solve this together. Um, to the point that was raised before about, um, you know, is this the, the, the buy side? Can the ANA do something that's individual? If we aren't all uh, working together, then we get challenges where uh, if a publisher says, well, I don't want to have this thing, but the advertiser wants it, it's very hard for that conversation to happen because there's no alignment, uh, they want to be able to get the revenue, and they're kind of stuck. If it's another scenario where the buy side says, well, we're not going to support this particular ad experience, and the publishers are saying, well, we are accepting it, well, then someone else will go around that and say, okay, well, I, I guess I can do that ad experience, and they have the incentive to do that. So in, unless we can all work together, unless we come together to address this problem uh, as a group across these different uh, organizations, it's going to be very hard to actually make a change in this industry. And it's really exciting to me personally that there is such alignment, that there is such um, uh, excitement about this and a very common approach, that we need to understand what's annoying consumers, understand what uh, they find frustrating, on a global basis, and that may be different in, in Europe, that may be different in Asia. Uh, we need to test that and understand that. But if we can get a common understanding of what consumers find to be frustrating, if we can work together to say there's alternatives to that, we can get the same messaging to consumers, we can tell our stories that we need to tell, and we can do that in a way that consumers find interesting and uh, respectful, now this becomes a really exciting place for the online advertising industry to move to, and uh, we can move past this and back into a really great growth, uh, growth mode. Thank you, that's a terrific set of answers. We're gonna take questions in about two minutes, so that's your, uh, your Q&A uh, prep. Uh, I'll take the, uh, the moderator's prerogative or the co coalition coordinator's prerogative, just to give <laughs> a, a, a brief kind of update on where we are uh, before we jump into those questions. So, as you've heard, uh, the leading trade associations, both uh, in the U.S. and abroad, uh, announced uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Mexico, we announced uh, in a global setting, uh, because it is a global uh, coalition, uh, to a lot of fanfare, you know, 100 plus articles uh, written about it all over the, the world. And we, uh, part of the announcement uh, was a call to action. And uh, from that call to action, we've received um, uh, dozens, uh, more than 50 formal requests to participate in the organization, and, and we're parsing that through right now, um, but then dozens of additional um, less formal inquiries, and I expect that will continue as the word uh, gets out and we coalesce and organize uh, in, in the working groups to start moving towards outputs. The, um, the first um, uh, meeting kind of post De Mexico, post this, uh, will be occurring in the next week or two, um, which will be of the standards and research uh, committee to really drill down uh, with the group on some of the research that's been done, lessons that can be learned, is there additional research that could be going, learn uh, from the independent initiatives that have been going on so the group moves together uh, collectively. 
as you see from the slide there, uh, in addition to the trade associations, we have um, uh, from each of uh, the organizations uh, a couple of leading individual companies. And we are um, very encouraged with the um, desire to be uh, supportive and participate in this effort that we've gotten from a lot of additional companies and think it's uh, important to keep that cross-industry perspective and representation at the table to develop those types of solutions. So um, again, we're in some ways at the beginning, but uh, the years of uh, work of the associations and a lot of the work on these particular issues um, that have happened in the last year or two form uh, the appropriate foundation and, and I think justified the timing for, for moving forward now. So you can expect uh, this group to be very, very uh, active in the next uh, coming months and, and then on into the next uh, couple of years and, and hopefully uh, really um, moving the needle and the curve uh, and trajectory to continue this, this dialogue as technology is evolving. So uh, with that, um, why don't we turn to the uh, audience, see if there are uh, any questions. We'd, we'd be happy to take them. It's always hard to be the first question, so thank you. <laughs> Jason, you know, I was going to call on Jason. <laughs> uh, so I have a quick question. Essentially, it's with user engagement, right? So there's that gap between the user and the ad blocker and the ad, right? How are you facilitating that question to the user? Where they don't even want to hear from us, right? So what is that engagement? How do you want to set that standard going forward? And per device, right? Mobile is a different interaction. Desktop is a different interaction. OTT will be a different action. A smartwatch would be a different interaction. Mm -hmm. where, where is that leading to? You're asking me. Um, <laughs> a couple, couple of things. One, how do we talk to the consumer by giving them better advertising? That's number one, right? So we just launched on Monday a responsive ad portfolio, right? So because we are multi-screen, we're a multi-screen world, it's really important to talk to folks in the most effective way, in the most beautiful way, quote unquote. Um, so step one is it's making it better. Uh, step two, and the deal strategy I outlined earlier, is really a short-term conversation with the, with the consumer, right? It's, it's the ad blockers installed. The publisher needs a way to talk to the consumer immediately. So. Do they want to hear from us? Yeah, they kind of do. I will say from the publishers who are employing that strategy, people are, are engaging with the publisher. People are actually saying, okay, you know what, fine, I'll turn it off. Um, I will accept your proposal for either lighter ad experience, subscription, whatever it is. Um, but the, the caveat is it has to be a better experience. If they turn it off and it's bad, guess what? The relationship is actually more broken because there's no give take there. And to, to a last point, the, the, there is a relationship between the consumer and the publisher when they go to a site. Right. Uh, anyone who goes, and even if you're, if you're just going from a, a social or a search link to a, to a location, you're cognizant of where you are to understand what you're reading. Uh, there are certainly cues in terms of what kind of news source am I reading, what kind of information am I getting, and so that's already in someone's mind. And being able to have a respectful conversation with the consumer to say, hey, you know, we need to be able to provide uh, monetization to pay the people who've done these uh, articles, who've written the content that you're here for. And by the way, uh, we're working with uh, something like the coalition to find out what ad experiences are annoying. We don't have those here, so we're not going to annoy you. Now you can respectfully have that conversation with the consumer and the trade-off's much easier to do. And uh, we've seen this work in, uh, many different sites, there's a lot of great experimentation happening, a lot in Europe as well, to be able to have that kind of uh, interaction with consumers. And there's good ways to do it, there's not good ways to do it. There's great uh, examples now that you can see on both sides of the spectrum. But the good news is consumers are willing to have that conversation and uh, are willing to engage to Alana's point, and so uh, it's very promising as a path forward. Anyone else on the panel? I just think the, the, the creative advertising has to be, uh, you know, equal to the to, to, to the content and and uh, you know has to has to listen and learn as part of um, what the consumer is willing to accept. And technology is going to play a huge part in enabling the execution um, because of the speed of which um, you know programmatic is moving. Um, it, you know, it requires you know content, creative, consumer insights, and and great technology to deliver it. 
Other questions? So the elephant in the room is the data supply chain. So much of the consumer complaint is around page load latency, the weight of advertising. I agree with you. It's also creative, but we hear constantly, uh, particularly on mobile, the reduced experience because of the weight of the ad. That Closing that down or removing a lot of that data supply chain could be difficult for many of your members. How are we going to deal with the data side of the supply chain to create that better advertising experience? So, so two things. I know Scott wants to weigh in too. I'm aligned on this one. Um, there's been research. We have our own research that we just did at, at the IEB and at the Tech Lab, and it's interesting to see. Um, it was U.S. only, to be very specific, but consumers were very upset when ads covered the content. Right, pop-ups. Uh, larger interstitials, all of the above. Um, we didn't really hear about the latency piece, however, it's kind of tied in part and parcel to the larger macro concepts. Um, the, we are addressing it across the board. We're talking very heavily about things like data plans right, on the mobile devices. How do we ensure that we preserve our consumers' experience and their data? So as an example, we are, as part of our new ad portfolio, we, we launched uh, new guidelines around data usage. So outstream, um, autoplay video, we don't recommend you do that anymore for 4G and below. If it's 4G and above, it's a better experience, it's optimized, but uh, LTE, 3G, we recommend not pushing data through the pipe um, in an autoplay fashion, it has to be consumer initiated. So things like that are being thought about both in the tech lab and also the wider coalition. I know Scott has other points to add, so I'll let him dive in. Well, it, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it's been surprisingly consistent across people who've looked at this question. But uh, what surprised me and, and, and sort of uh, illustrates that people who are in ad tech really shouldn't uh, uh, trust their instincts in terms of trying to understand consumers. Well, consumers, when you, when you do research which can really uh, understand how they're interacting with a, a site, what frustrates them is the experience of the ad being interrupted, having content that's blocked, not able to get things uh, there. They're not actually bothered by latency or pixels or those things that we normally think about in that environment. It's a difference between saying to somebody, by the way, if you didn't have these ads, you could have been faster. Well, great, I don't want those ads. And if you ask somebody, would you like these things? Well, no. But if you actually run the experiment and say to a consumer, gee, I've got uh, this ad and it's got three pixels and this ad that doesn't, don't tell them the difference and you just have those two run, they, they, if it's done properly, you can't tell the difference. So uh, it really comes down to understanding what's actually annoying consumers and having the data drive this discussion rather than it being conjecture uh, from us. There certainly may be places where lower bandwidth uh, things are going to frustrate consumers. We need to understand that. We need to have the data to understand that. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we're not uh, inadvertently doing uh, too much and doing things the wrong way because uh, you know, the, the way things work. Um, the other thing that's interesting that's happening, we've been doing a lot of work with something called AMP. And what AMP does is AMP makes the page much, much faster. And the ad uh, is separate. It's sandbox, so it, 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 if it's not fast, it just, you know, it won't load or um, there's limitations in what it can do. And what that's created is it's really shifted uh, the conversation and the, uh, the dynamic of the creative and the ad, uh, and the content. Consumers love this, they get the content. But no consumer's gonna wait for the ad. They're done, they're, they're very happy with that. And if the ad is fast enough and is light enough to be able to load, you can get great viewability, you can get great response, and it's fantastic. But if the ad is not able to be loaded quickly, then the con consumer's gone and they're already on to the next article. And so, um, it's, it's a great dynamic because now the incentive comes back to the industry to say, hey, you know, the consumer's got a great experience. They're very happy with everything we're doing. Uh, if you want to be able to get the message to that, you've got to make it lighter. You've got to have a faster HTML piece in there, and that's going to have restrictions in terms of uh, how much data one can do, how many pixels can fire, et cetera. So um, there's lots of innovation in this space that's able to do that, but if we really just want to focus on the user, let's get them the experience that they want then everything else can follow from that in terms of how we can solve the rest of the problems. Anyone else? Anything they want to add on that? 
All right, well, I think we are at about time. Uh, why don't you join me in giving our panelists a big round of applause for a job well done. And uh, stay tuned for, uh, for more developments in this area.